Welcome everyone to, uh, to Out of Way um, and to a house that is seeing new life again today. Um, welcome to what we hope will be uh, the first in a number of fireside chats where uh, an old timer can sit here and tell stories. Today it's appropriate that the first in this fireside chat series is with Rob. Uh, Crosby, uh, who grew up in this ho house. Um, he was born in Banff 90 years ago. You're 90? Right. Yes. Good. 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 I know, but... <laughs> 90 years ago, uh, and uh, his mother and father, uh, Gertrude and Lou Crosby, built this house. Um, he grew up here, and now he's back home. Welcome back home, Rob. How does it feel to be back in uh, in the old the old family home? Well, I'm, I'm a little impressed, uh, impressed favorably. But it looks the way it does now. They've spruced it up a little bit. It's the original maple floor. I'm missing the sheep head from the uh, wall there. But I can't remember this many people sitting in this living room at any time, even when we had birthday parties. <laughs> but uh, it's so, they're so welcome. And uh, as, you, as we go along with questions, any questions that people have in the, in the crowd, I'll try to answer as closely as I can. But welcome anyway. <laughs> Great, Rob. That's uh, wonderful. Um, first question, where does the name Abigway come from? Well, my father was born in PEI, and uh, he took uh, accounting there. And he came west as Jim Brewster's first bookkeeper, and became bookkeeper, accountant, treasurer, Vice President and eventually President when Jim Brewster passed away. But that was Abiquit is a PEI uh, Indian, it's a Micmac Indian word for cradled in the waves. And that's the origin of, of Abiquit, it's quite well known in PEI. Good, thank you, Rob. And, uh... You told us a little bit about your, your dad and where he came from and where he worked. Uh, 57 years at Brewster's, I think, that's right? That's right. Yeah, where did, where did your mom come from and how did your mom and dad meet? Uh, my mother came from Rickmansworth in England. Their family, the Seaton family, immigrated to uh, uh, Vancouver Island and uh, she grew up in the Vancouver area and took a telegrapher's course from the CPR, became a telegrapher, and was transferred from Vancouver to Chilliwack, to Vernon, to Revelstoke, to Lake Louise. And she was the telegrapher at the Chateau Lake Louise. My dad was a bookkeeper for Jim Brewster. They met and uh, both liked to hike and climb. <coughs> excuse me, and climb. So uh, you know, it went the normal course of events. They got married and, uh, and they had, had a family, and we grew up here. Um, how many kids? Five. Five. And you were the youngest. Yeah. And who were the others? Fred was the eldest, Doug was next, Marion was next, and Marjorie was next. And uh, they, you know, the usual spread through a family. Um, we all seem to collect here in the summertime, usually working in the summertime to get tuition to go to university, because we all went to a university of one sort in our lifetime right. and uh, yeah. so, so the family always got together in the summertime mm -hmm. even if it was just for 
climbing or canoeing or golf. <laughs> I think or your, working. Your your dad was quite a climber, as I remember, wasn't he? Camera. Uh, your dad wasn't Lou. Didn't I see Lou Crosby's name doing a first ascent somewhere? A mountain climber. In which? A mountain climber. Oh yes. Yeah. Well, his dad was a very ardent mountain climber, and uh, I, I don't think there's anything around here or Lake Louise that he hadn't climbed. He made the first ascent on Dove Devil's Head and Louie, and uh, they're both badge climbers. He was active in the formation of the Alpine Club. Um, my mother and dad were both members of the Alpine Club. And um, so we did a certain amount of climbing together. I was just a little kid, so I didn't go to any of the big climbs until my brother Doug and I climbed just about everything around Lake Louise and Banff. And uh, we, we climbed because of Dad's first ascent on uh, Devil's Head. Doug and I climbed Devil's Head too. It's, it's not that well known, but it's that prominent, uh, prominent thumb that you see as you're driving from Calgary to Banff. It's uh, not too far from the end of Lake Minnewonka. In fact, that's what we did. We took a boat to Bar Jim Brewster's boat <laughs> and uh, went down to uh, the end of Minnewonka and hiked into Devil's Head, climbed it, and uh, left a note on the top, as you normally do, and uh, then came back on the boat, mm -hmm. tied it up. Right. Thank Jim Brewster for the use of his boat. That's a long day. Sneak over here and grab that glass of water that I had prepared and forgot to put out. Here's a here's a glass of water for you, Rob. If you need it, want to take it. Thank you. Just yeah. My voice is not that strong. Mm -hmm. So your dad was the climber. Um, yes. That. The, the, the family, the Crosby family, is really noted for Deer Lodge in Lake Louise. Uh, and that was your mother's creation, I think, wasn't well, it? Well, there's a, sort of a long story, too. But uh, um, when my mother was telegrapher for the Chateau, um, and she was going with my father, she said, what Lake Louise needs is a quiet little tea room where you go and get a cup of tea. She's from England. So tea is a national drink over there, I think. So they built this quiet little tea room, which is at present time the actual dining room in their lodge. But having built the tea room, there was a little shop extended. I mean, they. Every year something was built on, and it grew like Topsy. Uh, they eventually bought up the, the uh, YWCA and added it. Um, the cafeteria that was across the street, they, it went broke, so they bought it. And that's how Deer Lodge, as a group of rather strange looking buildings grew and uh, of course we as a family uh, that was our summer job doing whatever you could do um, I was a bellhop and got enough money bellhopping to go to U of A <laughs> I've cut grass up there I've uh, driven our garbage truck uh, my eldest brother was interested in hotel work and he took a hotel management course in Cornell and came back and was a manager of Deer Lodge for the rest of his life until he passed away. But that was, that was his career, but without going through all the family, everybody, I guess, every, 
All my brothers and sisters went to a university of one kind mm. in their lifetime. Okay. And had various careers. Right. Now, you were born here in Banff. I was born in Banff. In 1921. Right. And you were not born in a hospital. Where were you born? Well, at that time, there was a nursing home run by a Miss Herkums. The nursing, that nursing home was down uh, it, was, it was on Banff Avenue, but uh, it just past Moose Street in that way. Yeah. And that was a, um, a maternity center when Brett had, was creating his hospital where the present hospital is. Mm -hmm. And of course it expanded and uh, Herkham's uh, maternity ward gradually disappeared when she passed away. Mm -hmm. Now, was it a, you called it a nursing home. Is it a nursing home or a birthing, birthing house? What? Both. It was both. Oh, was yeah. it? Oh, I okay. mean, yeah, I don't remember that exactly, but I was born there. <laughs> yeah. No, we remember that. That's good. That's good. That's good. All, all my brothers and sisters were also born there. Yeah. yeah. And it was the place where people went to give birth to children. Yeah. And the, the hospital was, uh, did everything else. Yeah. You know, the, the, Brett, the, the Brett story is, I think, quite well known. Uh, it was, he was a doctor and, uh, they did, just did about everything. There weren't that many ski injuries at that point because skiing was not developed. <laughs> no. Uh, it, it grew and was rebuilt. And uh, as the town grew and every time, was, time goes on. Yeah. So when you grew up in this area, it was full of kids, wasn't it? Uh, <laughs> there was the clouds and the, well, and the whites and all these okay, people. Okay, the, the white found it, the white family uh, lived next door. The Simpson family, the Margaret and Mary Simpson lived right on um, Moose Street and at the corner there. The McLeod family lived where I'm living now. They had five kids. Brewster didn't have any children, but Jim Brewster let us play tennis on his <laughs> tennis court. <laughs> um, the Sewell family lived, uh, they, they were the original of the homestead. They lived just farther on down the block. So yes, there were a lot of kids around there. And uh, the school, we had a good public school, a good high school. It was, uh, had a very good reputation in Alberta for our education. Mm. Good, good. Um, and you were uh, a keen skier and a keen skater, a, gra a great skater. Uh, what do you want to talk about first, the skiing or the skating? Uh, well, my dad was a speed skater when he was in PEI. So speed skating and track were his favorite sports when he came west. So everybody in our family had a pair of skates. <laughs> and we all learned to skate because it had this big rig out, out in front. The river used to freeze over. And we had often, there's a couple of pictures I think there of uh, the family. We would skate up the river. <coughs> go as far as we could and uh, let the wind blow us back. And uh, then Mather, who had the boat, the boat uh, concession here, also built a skating rink. He built a skating rink on the river, and in order to lengthen his season, he built one across the river. You can still see the clearing there, but he used his, his uh, boat wharfs there's, you could float them up and made a pontoon bridge. 
from the bottom of, of um, Buffalo Street to his skating rink. And of course, after school, where should I go? Just across the river on his pontoon bridge, and I'd skate there for until he closed. Mm -hmm. um, skiing was, um, I don't know whether you've heard the name Victor Couture and the Swiss guides. They started uh, downhill skiing because they're all from Switzerland. And uh, Victor taught a lot of the kids the fundamentals of downhill skiing. In fact, we had a junior uh, ski team in which we put together local kids. But the um, I like both sports. Mm -hmm. I used and you were good at both. I used to skate after after school every day of the week and and go skiing at Norquay on the Saturday and Sunday. And you used to ski right from the house, didn't you? To Norquay. Well, yeah, originally. Mm -hmm. That was before they had that road finished. And then eventually the road was finished to Norway, and uh, my dad would often drive us up, but we, the kids would usually walk uh, and climb up there with skis on their back, and uh, mm -hmm. it, it was always fun skiing down through the trail, it went right through the trees, you know, and... Um, down the gully run. Yeah. Yeah. So it was... Uh, Good exercise, if nothing else. Yeah. Do you want another drink of water? You okay? Yeah, I will. Yeah. The, um, but Victor Couture was well known here and in Alberta for his uh, downhill skiing, downhill and sound. And uh, that was part of skiing that I was, I concentrated in as well. Mm. And uh, I bought my Northway ticket, Northway ticket last week. <laughs> Good for you. So you're going, you're going in the in the in the the, the Bruno race. The, oh, I have to go in now. I won it every year since it won. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they have them in age groups. You see. Chess Edwards and well, and Chess the Edwards, Paris, Chess Paris. Edwards, uh, Ted Paris, Rube Edwards. These were. He, so much older than I was, they were seniors when I was a, a very my, much of a junior because they were the same age as my eldest brother. And, uh, but they did do a lot of pioneer work uh, as guides at Sunshine and Skokie as Sunshine and Skokie were expanding. and. Um, uh, Ted Paris, I think, was on the national team. Mm -hmm. He was the hottest competitor of the, that age group here. Mm -hmm. But they were all excellent skiers and taught all the kids, like myself, how to ski downhill, how to ski in deep powder, and how to ski in slalom. Yeah. So. Um, and then the, the Dominion Championships in 1937. They were. 30, 37, they had the. Canadian Championships and downhill slalom here on cross country skiing. And uh, uh, our junior team were flag judges. <laughs> <laughs> right. But on the junior team, there's Frank Gordy, whose dad ran the Gordy Drugstore, and uh, Donnie Luthwaite and Gordy Hoggard, who were both, <clears throat> excuse me, killed in World War II. And uh, Bud Gurley mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So our junior ski team was sort of disintegrated with the war. Mm -hmm. They didn't come back. Now the war really interfered with your skating career too. You were winning everything before the well, war. Well, skating, uh, my dad was instrumental in forming um, the Alberta Championships speed skating and uh, because that was tied in with the Bath Winter Carnival 
of the set history of the Van Flinder Carnival, I won't go into it, but it was a very active 10 days in the middle of winter, usually February, and it had every, every winter sport involved, including uh, well, there's skiing, skating, figure skating, curling, um, um, horseback, well, horseback riding, horse, uh, what's the word? Ski joring. Ski joring, yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> the ski joring behind horses, that was usually done on the river. And there was cross country, cross country skiing uh, up and down the river and various trails, including around the golf course as as cross country courses. Most of the downhill and slalom were always at Norway because it was close to the town, and the carnival was centered in the town. Right. And um, so we had slalom and downhill in all classes, ladies and men. In, uh, in the carnival, and they also had, they say, speech, they had figure skating, but they also had speech skating in all classes, uh, under 12, under 14, under 16, under 18, and seniors. And uh, as I grew through these stages, I was fortunate enough to usually end up winning them. <laughs> <laughs> and you won some big uh, North American championships, didn't well, you? Uh, since speed skating became a fairly major sport, uh, my dad always, when he was, work, he was working for Brewster's and used to do a lot of tourism work in the winter time. So he took me on a couple of his trips to Winnipeg and he, happened, he was able to time it so that the Winnipeg, the Manitoba Speed Skating Championships were at the same time. And uh, I was, first time I won that was I was under 12. <laughs> you know, it, it, yeah. But uh, it, that sort of grew. And I, I won the Great Lakes Open Championship when I was 16. And that was symbolic of the North American outdoor speed skating championship uh, at that time. It was it was in uh, the Great Lakes Open. Was one of the races was in Chicago. The other was in, the uh, name, name slips my mind right now. But it was um, an outdoor, outdoor rink not far from Chicago. And uh, there was one. It, in it went on. Uh, I was told when I, uh, I won a couple of the races in the North American <coughs> Championship that I would be going for sure in the next Olympics. Well, the next Olympics at that point would have been in 1940. And uh, of course, World War II came along and it was canceled. So that was the end of that. But um, I had reached the point where I was probably, for my age, one of the better speed skaters in certainly Western Canada. And uh, I have medals to show that. Yeah, well, I've seen them lots. <laughs> have another drink? Uh, okay. 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 Um, so, 1940, you didn't get to go to the Olympics, but you went away to university and started a whole new part of your life. That's right. I went to U of A after grade 12 and uh, took engineering. I was on the U of A ski team and I did some speed skating up there. They still had the Alberta Championship. It was in Wetaskiwin one year, in Edmonton the next year, and I won a few medals then. Um, so I, uh, after two years at U of A, I was always interested in aeronautics and flying, 
and uh, they didn't have aeronautical engineering up there. But UBC had a couple of courses in their uh, last two years of engineering up there. So I transferred. I was able to transfer from U of A to UBC and pick it up. So I graduated from UBC, so I was also on the UBC ski team. <laughs> ski up at um, Cross Mountain. Mm -hmm. Know it quite well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't do any skiing there, but uh, I kept the skiing up there. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. And you got your degree in engineering in uh, yes, 1944. 44. Yeah. And uh, one little word on that is that in 44, every if you're a physically fit person, you're automatically in the reserve army. So about over half of our graduating class in mechanical engineering in 44 was uh, put in the army and we went to Kingston for the training with the Royal Canadian Electrical Mechanical Engineers, the RCEME. So from, they went from Kingston down to Brockville, and I was, when that was all over with, I was transferred to Ottawa, and I uh, was, oh, and I, by that time I was married, and I moved the whole family up there, so. <laughs> <laughs> I was three. Years. You were I was three and, and when you went to that. Yeah, well, the family was, fortunately, I will say this, that the armed forces were generous enough to move a person with their family uh, at that time. The war was winding down, but they were still building up. Uh, but I won't go into that. There's, mm -hmm. The story goes on on that. Yeah, yeah, well, um, uh, uh, and then you transferred to the Air Force. I well, thought you were in the Army to begin with. The I was, okay, a, I'll try to be quick. The Army had a, um, a, a east of Ottawa, <clears throat> the Army had a proving ground, and uh, I was in the vehicle design branch of the Army on, on, from University or from Kingston. And uh, so I used to go out to the proving ground. They were testing tanks, big guns, and motorcycles. I know how to ride a motorcycle now. <laughs> and uh, and uh, track cars. But the. Uh, <clears throat> The story, uh, the interesting thing was that the Air Force had an experimental station in Rockcliffe. And I used to go past Rockcliffe to the Army uh, proving grounds every day pretty well. And uh, one day I, I went into the Air Force uh, experimental proving establishment just to see what they were doing. And uh, I was talking to their chief engineer and uh, expressed my interest in airplanes. And he said, well, if you like airplanes, why don't you transfer? <laughs> so he, and I said, how do I do that? He said, leave it to me. <laughs> and he worked with Air Force headquarters and arranged a transfer from Army to the Air Force, and I went from a second lieutenant army to a pilot officer, then a flying officer in the Air Force with the Central Experimental Improving Establishment. It's a good name. Mm. But we did a lot of uh, research, uh, crash investigation, uh, aircraft testing, uh, out of Rockcliffe, and uh, I like that kind of work. Yeah. 
And then they sent you south to school again. Well, they, after two years there, they said, you're interested, would you like to go to school again? And I said, well, what do you mean? And they said, well, you mentioned an interest in becoming an aeronautical engineer. So why don't you tell us where, where you could go and get that? And uh, I said, well, there's Caltech and there's the University in Chicago and there's MIT and there's several others that uh, teach advanced courses. And uh, they said, well, we'll send you to Boston for a year to MIT and you can carry on with your aeronautical engineering, which I did. They sent me down there for one year. I was able to do two semesters back to back. So I got my degree in a master's degree in <coughs> aeronautical engineering. And uh, of course that led to coming back to Ottawa and getting into their advanced aircraft <coughs> group. Now we're getting into interesting parts. Yeah, this is yeah, this the, is a good uh, story. You worked on, you worked on a very special airplane. Well, I don't know if people here probably do re remember what the um, international situation was like in the late forties. You know. Um, the, we, we weren't too friendly with Russia, but they weren't too friendly with us, I'm not sure who. But um, they, there wasn't, Canada needed a special aircraft that was fast, would go a long way, go high, carry weapons, because there were Russian reconnaissance airplanes flying over the Northwest Territories and Hudson's Bay. I did some, <coughs> some cold, cold weather testing with the Central Experimental Improving Establishment in Churchill. I spent a, much of a winter, winter in Churchill and uh, not only did I see polar bears, but we saw reconnaissance missiles and aircraft from Russia flying over the Northwest Territory. So that, that created the need for Canada to have an aircraft that could combat that threat. There wasn't anything on the drawing board in England or in the States so the job was given to A.D. Rowe, Canada, and that was the beginning of the Arrow program. And it was a supersonic, long-range, high-altitude aircraft, carried two people and six missiles. And uh, that was the next five years of my career. <laughs> and the Arrow, the Arrow Arrow is... Yeah, well, the, 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 it, almost it, the greatest uh, plane in Canadian history. I have pictures, and I, I witnessed witnessed the first flight of number one, and I have seen the first six fly, and I was I was sort of the go between Air Force headquarters in Ottawa and uh, the Air, Admiral aircraft company in Toronto and this, so the next five years I was on that program until it was cancelled by Diefenbaker. Why, why did he cancel it? Well it was expensive because we were doing a lot of basic research and they had to pay a lot of money to use the wind tunnels in the States doing supersonic tests on and design things which hadn't been done before. And that was going to cost, that was certainly costing money. 
But Diefenbaker, I guess by that time through the United Nations, the threat from Russia was not quite as severe. And Diefenbaker was looking for ways to shut, to cut off his, his costs. So he canceled it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was also witness to the demolition of five flying aircraft and many on the assembly line still still waiting. Mm -hmm. So it was all they were cut up and sold for scrap with the exception of a few parts uh, that uh, I was instrumental in working with the museums and salvaged enough to build what is pretty well a good replica in the Aviation Museum in Ottawa. Uh, there is a re replica of the, well it's not a replica, it's a reconstruction of the arrow. Uh, it doesn't have engines in it, but it's, you get the idea. And the story is in that, and there are other bits and pieces in aviation museums across Canada that people snuff, you know, got, they got some way. <laughs> right. But most of it went for scrap. What and so did a few millions of dollars go for scrap. Yeah. So that was pretty close to the end of your career with, with, uh, well, with the Air Force. I, uh, at the end of that program, I was transferred to Air Force Headquarters and was working in the uh, advanced development section. In fact, I was second in command there. And I had a, I'm not going to bore you with the story. No, <laughs> yeah, yeah, keep going, that's good. But I had, the, the, the end of it is, that uh, I was offered um, a promotion and be <coughs> become a group head of this uh, advanced aircraft section. Or, by that time I had 25 years of service, or I could retire with a pension. And at the same time, the family was here in Banff, and the family business was a little wheeze. So I flipped a coin and came back to Bath. Bath one. So, Bath one. And, and when, uh, when did you come and back? I, I, and to wind it up, I did retire with a pension. I'm, I'm living here on a pension, but I did work at Lake Louise in the final sale of the hotel, and uh, the uh, end of it all. I must include the children as well. Anita and Rick went through all these jumps and changes of school and uh, survived. So, um, She's got her own, to own story to tell, I'm sure. But anyway, she, she became a nurse. Uh, Rick, when he finished high school, went east, and uh, he ended up with a, a Sears outlet store in Nova Scotia. It's about as far east as you can get. And they ran that for several years since he, he did sell it. Family details. He did separate from his wife, and uh, he moved west. And he spent a lot of time working with the Lake Louise ski area. He was a ski instructor, and he was also very instrumental in their safety programs. So he was. He, he worked with the ski area before he went east, and uh, for quite a while after he came east. So he likes to ski and hike and mm -hmm. do all sorts of things right. like that. And then there's one person that we haven't talked about. That's Evelyn, your sweetheart, your high school sweetheart. Uh, Evelyn, I'll go back to Lake Louise again. <laughs> <laughs> Evelyn's 
father worked for the CPR, and they were living in Lake Louise um, at the same time. We had Deer Lodge growing up there, but they don't, they had a public school up there. There was the Asling family, the Matter family, uh, another family up there, and the Swiss guys. Uh, but if anyone, anybody wanted to go to high school, they came to Banff. So Evelyn came to Banff and was, went to high school when I was in high school. And so we, we skied and skated together. Went together as, as normally two young teenagers would do. Mm -hmm. And um, we got closer and closer until when I went away to U of A, um, and I came back here for the summer, and it looked like I was going to be involved in the in the army and going overseas, not knowing whether I'd ever come back. We rather rashly decided to get married then, and uh, so we did. We got married, and uh, Anita was born in Vancouver in the middle of my pathological exam. <laughs> So the family, uh, Rick was born after that, and, uh, but with, that was, you know, the war cooled off, and uh, I stayed in the Air Force uh, because I was interested in the Arrow program. Right. So we lived in Toronto for five years or so. Yeah. Um, and I'm. I'm and then we came home. How many years did that, you were married for how many years, Devlin? How many years of marriage did you have? Did which? How many years of marriage did you have with Evelyn? We were married for 70 years. Wow. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah, and, uh, you know, happily married for 70 years. Uh, we had three children. Anita, Rick, and uh, Heather. Heather, unfortunately, was the youngest, and uh, she had she contacted leukemia somehow and passed away. But Rick and Anita are still with us. Thank God. Thank God. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Rob. It's, it's been wonderful to hear your story and. Uh, <coughs> Is there anything that we've missed that you would like to say to us yeah. with well, your wisdom of age? I thought we were going to talk about the house. <laughs> oh. oh, well, we could talk. Okay. You got me there. I want Tell to, us about the house. I want, to say, I want to say one thing about the house that uh, in, in going through it, the, um, there's so much that brings back old memories and my mother liked flowers so we built so they built the, the glass house over there beside and they I can remember when this solarium was built it was back in the 30s and that was because my mother and father were both fond of flowers and my oldest brother liked to grow cacti so uh, he had his little corner and at the same time, this lobby, there are two big windows where that arch is, and beyond that was an open uh, veranda, um, open space. We used to keep our bicycles and our canoe and often skis there rather than have them in the house. But my mother said, well, that's sort of wasted space. Why don't we um, push the wall out and extend the side, the, the living room, to include that portion? So the front front door. It's the same same location as that, 
but uh, the canoe's gone. <laughs> Bicycles are gone. But it's uh, it, all kidding aside. It it just made the the whole living room area so spacious and uh, so much enjoyed with a family with five kids that were growing up and uh, various hobbies and uh, schoolwork and mother and dad both busy. My mother always used to sit in this corner, my dad would sit in that corner. That's where we had a piano. Fred was a great pianist. He bought the organ, which is around there now. So he wanted to have an organ. He had a piano and an organ in this space, which would be a little crowded. So there's another reason why it went north. <laughs> and uh, yeah. so that was, I guess, we all took piano lessons. And uh, Fred, my eldest brother, liked music. Music was his hobby. And uh, when he was going to U of A, he took a science course up there. But the, um, the head of the science department was the University of Alberta organist. And he gave lessons to my brother and uh, got him playing a pipe organ, which he played at U of A, and he ended up playing a church organ here, and uh, got himself an electric organ, which is around the corner there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had his music, which was very pleasurable most of the time. Uh, used to practice hour after hour. Mm -hmm. Some of the fugues he would play were not that interesting, but they were good exercises. And uh, as I say, it was a very cozy situation. He was playing the piano. My mother was here. My dad was over there. Uh, we had a fire in the fireplace. And uh, at that point, I was probably playing with toys on the floor. And uh, we had a big dog who used to sneak in. That was life. <laughs> that was like, it sounds. That's it. Sounds idyllic. It sounds that was beautiful. part. Of, that's part of this house. Yeah. Part of the history of the house. Right. The rest of it. Um, my sisters lived in the big room upstairs, and uh, I lived in. We had a, the boys had a room, the head of the stairs to the left. We had a German lady as a maid. She came over here after World War I and uh, needed work. And uh, so she was a maid for all of, I would say probably 20, over 20 years. And uh, which was very useful because my mother was up and down to Lake Louise so often and dad was working for grocers. And, uh, so she, uh, she was part of the family. Really. Yeah, I'll bet she was. And uh, so the, the house hasn't changed very much. Yet. They made uh, missing the mountain sheep that was pound, <laughs> mounted there. Maybe we can find Some it. of the pictures are different, but they're very nice, appropriate pictures and the one that I think you have named the Crosby room has got pictures in there. That was uh, where my mother used to do her office work um, and they uh, hiring staff for Lake Louise and working after the Lake Louise bookkeeping during the winter and that sort of thing. So it was a, everybody in the family worked at some point in Deer Lodge, either, as I say, I did, I was bellhop for a couple of years and cut the grass, drove their truck, mm -hmm. uh, some, fixed some of the plumbing fixtures, 
uh, Fred was a manager. Um, Gary and Marge were, were busy. And uh, my other brother, Doug, was working for Brewster's. Mm. He was under, worked for Ralph Hardy. As yeah. a matter of fact, Ralph yeah. Hardy worked for my dad. Yeah. Those yeah. are familiar names. That's Ralph Eanes. Uh, Ralph Eanes not here. She, she was. Yeah. She had to leave, I think, for a, a 90th birthday party. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, do, do you want to answer any questions, if anybody no. has any questions? Anybody sure. got any questions any they'd questions? like to ask? What have I missed? Well, <laughs> we've covered a lot. Well, that's mainly my life, but uh, as a family, I would say it was a very happy family. Five kids and two adults, and we had a lot of things in common. My dad was, as I say, active in winter sports and the carnival, but he was also uh, president of the golf club several times. So we all took up golf in the summertime. And uh, we all won prizes at various times. He was club champion a couple of times. I won the juniors. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, Marion, my sister, won the ladies' championship one year. One, uh, Priscilla Cup was a, a sign of the uh, Priscilla Hammond had donated a cup. And uh, Marion won that one year. So we were quite active in the golf course in the summertime. It's not all skiing and skating. No, no. We would go down to the golf course after dinner often. Uh, my dad, my mother, and Doug and Mary and I uh, play two holes and maybe three holes depending on the length of the day. But uh, as club members, my dad used to buy a family membership so there was no problem going down and uh, playing some of the first holes on the original course. Do you remember the original? Yeah, 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 I played it. Well, if you started on the original second hole, mm -hmm. you could play the second, the third, the sixteenth, and seventeenth. And say hello to Casper McCullough on the way. Okay. Because he lived in the old clubhouse. Okay. <laughs> well, that's good. So, uh, how are we doing? Anybody have any, any questions? Oh, there's one, Leo. Jake, oh, yeah. you were asking Rob when he came back to Banff. I remember when he did, but Rob didn't answer you. Yes, and when was that? 1970. 1970 you came yeah. back. Yeah. From there on, actually, I saw Rob always yeah. skis. Yeah. Yeah. There was another question I would like to ask Rob, me who follows history and all that. There was a golf course below the Cascade where the airport is. Can you answer that at all? Which is that? The golf course out at the airport. Was there a golf course below the Cascade uh, near, yes. the, near where no, the airport no. was? I didn't play. I played there a couple of times, but I flew an airplane there more often than <laughs> But that was, a, that was a little golf, nine hole golf course that was built by the government, surprisingly. And uh, it was very, very cheap, but it, was, it served the purpose of people that were just starting golf and didn't want to pay the fees at the Bam Springs. They play on this nine hole course. But it uh, wasn't used enough to justify it. But it was, uh, that's when they built the airport. Mm. Now there's a story behind the, on the airport. Uh, the environmental, I hope there's not any environmentalists in the crowd that are going to be But um, they, they were very strong against closing the airport. They wanted it uh, to be natural again. 
And uh, so we were members of the uh, aviation, well, COPA, Canadian or Owners and Pilots Association, that's what this pin's about. And uh, we used to uh, fly around the mountains, but there were, at that point there were four airplanes out there that were owned by different people in town. And uh, we flew enough to realize that the traffic, airplane traffic with small airplanes from Calgary to BC, from Calgary to Vancouver, came right over Burnham. There were a couple of forced landings. People had trouble, and they landed on the highway. This is what, before the Trans Canada was built. And uh, there were some near accidents that way. And so our pitch from the airplane point of view was that it's better to keep, at least allow airplanes to land at this strip since they're not going to use it as a golf course. So you notice that there's still a strip and there's a sock out there. And there have been some forced landings on that strip rather than landing on the Trans-Canada Highway and forcing a bus, a bus into the ditch or something like that, which was very nearly happened a couple of times before we were allowed to, before it was used as an emergency strip. And, uh, I'm not saying that I didn't land on the highway a couple of times. <laughs> not because I had to, but I was interested to see if you could. <laughs> uh, okay. uh, I'll, just before you get to Johnson Canyon, there's quite a nice strip there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll all remember that, Rob. <laughs> It, it's narrow, but a straight level. <laughs> okay, any more questions? Uh, there's probably still tea and coffee and cookies in there. Uh, take your time, wander around the house, and thank you, Rob. You got any more? Yeah, we covered a lot, I think so. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Things come back in your memory. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that was good. And...